All right, welcome. So this is uh, lecture 11 for uh, logic design, and uh, the date is 9-21-20. Um, I was going to work the test in this video, and actually I, I did a video where I did that and, and then started on the, on the unit 5. Unfortunately, I, I somehow it didn't get saved. So my fault entirely, I think. But anyway, um, so what I'm going to cover today, I, I'm, I'm not going to work the test because uh, there's at least one person that still has to take it who had some medical issues. So, so, we're gonna, so we'll do that, and, uh, and we'll come back to it uh, in a little bit. All right, but what I will do is Unit 5. And one of the things that, that we have in Unit 5, it, we also have a little introduction to hardware description languages. So let me just say a few things about HDLs. Uh, We'll, we'll shrink this down, and uh, here we are. So, um, yeah, yeah. Okay. So basically, uh, we're going to cover obviously in digital systems design. We cover very log in depth, and we uh, generate bit files using a big integrated development environment to program uh, Xilinx uh, field programmable gate arrays. And we we have these two hundred dollar boards that we issue to each student. Uh, they need to turn them back in, um, and uh, and they and they do a bunch of labs with these boards and actually program them, and then they do sort of a special project as well. Uh, so by the time you finish that, you at least have a, sort of an entry level um, working knowledge of of the hardware description language Verilog. Um, we're going to cover more in in this course in units 10, 17, and 20, but we're really just going to do sort of an intro, give you a little taste, and that's about it. And unfortunately, the way this book is written, uh, they all the stuff in this book is VHDL. That's the hardware description language they use. But that's not the one we use in DSD. We use Verilog. And I think it's fair to say that in the United States, most, uh, almost all the, the chips that are made in the United States are made with using Verilog. I think in Europe, maybe a little more H VHDL is used. And then we do have some other things coming up. We'll talk about those in a second. So... Imagine if you have, if you're tasked with making an integrated circuit that happens to have 100 million transistors in it. And actually, that's a lot of transistors, but nowadays, uh, the latest NVIDIA cards have chip, has, have the, the big chip on them has 2 billion transistors. 2 billion. That is 2,000 million. 20 times what we're talking about with, a, with 100 million. Crazy, crazy, crazy. Um, imagine with two billion transistors laying out the circuit you want to build on your on your new integrated circuit chip on paper. Now just just if you only used maybe uh, half a square inch per transistor that would still be one billion square inches. That's a big piece of paper. I, I don't even know I, I hate to think I, I haven't didn't do the calculation. That's that's incredibly large, and uh, I, there's just no way you can do this. It cannot be done. You simply cannot design at, with a schematic the current chips that we're using today. Can't be done. Uh, it's just not possible. And so, this has sort of been true for a long time. But as as the complexity ramped up, the industry developed these hardware description languages. Uh, Initially, they were developed. A pretty, I guess the first one to come on the scene was VHDL. It was a DoD product and um, based on the on the programming language Ada, uh, which uh, you've probably never heard of, but it's one that uh, that the big uh, weapon systems companies uh, like Boeing and McDonnell Douglas and the people that make the big tanks and and the and the fighter jets, General Dynamics and whatnot, and Boeing. Uh, and I don't know a bunch of Rockwell. They all had to use this. In most cases, the the DoD required this uh, as the as the programming language for all the the system software on these weapon systems. So at some point, they they developed this this thing called VHDL, and the V stands for very high speed integrated circuit, and the HDL for hardware description language. So it's an acrostic within an acrostic. So they came up with VHDL primarily to document the software. It really had no other purpose. Uh, and then later on, somebody figured out that they could actually use it to run simulations. And so they, they, uh, they enhanced the integrated development environments and built simulators that could use the VHDL 
instructions and actually run simulations, uh, including uh, gate propagation, gate delays, and all sorts of uh, timing features. And these simulations helped them to uh, find bugs in the software, and, and it was a lot cheaper than, uh, uh, than having to build test articles and then exercise them and, and see that they broke, especially true with an airplane when you might have to be flying the thing to make it break and uh, people's lives are at risk and things crash into the ground and are destroyed. So simulating these things with software was a really great breakthrough. Well, that went on for a while, and then the next breakthrough was somebody looked at this and said, you know, I think we can actually uh, use this VHDL to actually manufacture integrated circuits. We can, we can have a synthesizer that will actually generate all the photo masks and all the steps we need in the foundry to actually make this circuit that you've described with this language. And, uh, and so that was the next big breakthrough. And that's kind of where we are now. We have now, uh, these languages can in fact, uh, if you buy the right software suite, um, Cadence, Mentor Graphics, some of these really big suites that cost a lot of money, uh, you, can, you can design an integrated circuit by using these English language statements in VHDL or in Verilog. And this, this, of course, uh, when you get to this, when you get to the sizes of two billion transistors, there's no way uh, this could ever be done with a schematic. Um, and also, little bitty changes would just be horrific. Uh, and the other thing is, you could, you could, what if you went through the process of of generating all the, all the masks and everything you had to have to do this in the foundry, and then you found a mistake? Oh my God you would want to commit Harry Carey. So that's why the simulation features of these languages are so important uh, because these, these massively complex chips uh, must, must be tested in computer simulations before you go to the cost of trying to manufacture one. Um, so, so this is a lot of what's allowed these, these, these major breakthroughs and this is why we, we have uh, more and more complicated, uh, incredibly powerful chips. Uh, the other thing is that prior, prior um, uh, HDL pro, you know, code can be repurposed and used again, and th that makes it very powerful. Um, you can reuse uh, parts of existing designs, and it allows us to do the design at a fairly high level of abstraction so that we can actually try maybe several different uh, strategies for, for you know, kind of the top level design as opposed to having to, uh, uh, you know, go through all the tedium of building something and then somebody's making a great suggestion, what if we started all over and did it this way? Well, people want to, you know, shove that person out the nearest window. Uh, clearly, you can only do that if you can do this in software and, uh, and where you haven't expended uh, tremendous uh, cost and time to actually make things. Um, so these are, so, so, the real magic, though, then has really come as we've had this these powerful synthesizers, uh, this powerful synthesizer software that's really allowed us to use these to to actually make chips, or in the case of programmable logic, uh, to generate the bit files that can configure uh, a field programmable gate array to be whatever logic you want it to be. And some of these FPGAs are very very advanced, very large chips. You can put uh, and on even this simple one that we use in in DSD, uh, well, it's not a simple one. It's a it's it's definitely a cutting line cutting edge chip. But even in that chip, uh, you could put uh, probably ten um, ARM cores uh, of some of the more you know advanced uh, ARM processors. Uh, you could you could build them on that chip by just uh, using the hardware description language and generating the bit files and then programming the chip. Uh, We'll talk a little bit more about that, but, but in the end, all of our hardware description languages really result in one of two things. It, it, it results in a brand new uh, integrated circuit, or it results in uh, a bit file that gets loaded into a programmable uh, field programmable gate array or complex programmable logic device. So those are really the ways that, the, that, that these um, languages are used and both are incredibly powerful. All right, so how important are they? It, they it's the whole story for digital design in, in this century, for sure. Uh, 
the uh, almost all the fabrications done in Verilog. Uh, VHDL is still used for complex simulations because it's a little more rigid and I guess a little better in its simulation features. Um, there are some new hardware description languages I'll mention in a minute, but they're they're kind of not yet re really being totally adopted uh, as far as I know it. That may change. We may be in right in the in the inflection point for that change uh, or soon. The other problem is most of these HDLs are very arcane, which means there there are lots of little difficult to learn details that make them a pain in the butt to uh, to get on top of. Um, you can't really overstate how important these are. That's why I think probably every electrical and computer engineering student should take DSD. Uh, and like we said, there are new ones being developed. One of the new ones is called System C. So it's a it's it's built on C++, uh, and it it uh it helps. Uh, it it has this. Uh, it provides this uh, this simulation interface. Um, one of the things that's very different about all the HDLs and System C as well is, is in a typical computer program, a typical computer language like C++, we execute instructions 1, 2, 3, and then we may hit a branch and go down to 10, 12, or 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, then maybe a branch in 26, 27, 20, and then maybe back to 1, 2, 3. Who knows? But we, we basically execute one instruction at a time. Now, obviously, uh, with pipelining, and branch prediction and look aheads and all sorts of stuff. Uh, these, uh, these big Intel and AMD chips uh, take, have taken that definitely to the next level. But still, uh, in concept, we're still executing one instruction at a time. We, we are not doing 100 instructions simultaneously. We might be partially executing in a pipeline of four or five or six or seven or maybe even more than that. But, but we have to wait at some point until the results from a critical value we need for the next instruction is actually finished before we can move on. So we, we these pipelines have uh, get, get held up here and there, and uh, but that's not true in in Verilog or in System C or in VHDL. In those languages, we have many statements that are executed simultaneously, all the time. Whenever the right the variables on the right side changes, the the the, in, the instruction executes automatically because it's just like hardware. It, you, imagine if you had a simple device with, say, three AND gates and an OR gate. Well, was anytime any of the inputs into the AND gates change or any input any of the inputs into the OR gate change, the gate's going to respond and generate a, a new output if the output is supposed to change. And all these gates are sitting there ready to respond the instant any one of the inputs changes. So when the when the right side of a logic equation changes, the output on the left side is going to respond. In hardware, that's how it happens, and that is definitely uh, what we make when we use a hardware description language. We're making hardware, so it works the same way. And that is one of the things that's hardest to kind of get under your belt. Um, all right, so anyway, so System C, that's one of the things. System Verilog is another thing that's out there being developed. Uh, started in 2002, uh, it, it has some features, but eh, it's not really there yet. Um, I'm not sure why. Uh, one of one of uh, one of the experts basically said the demos work great, but when you try and use it on real problems, uh, it doesn't work very well. So people are still hanging on to their standard HDLs. Um, so here are the two main ones in use today: Verilog and VHDL. Uh, Verilog came from C, and uh, we that's what we use in in this department. Uh, that's what we use in uh, in uh, DSD. That's also what Dr. Johns uses in his uh, his courses. Uh, so uh, that's generally what we use. Um, and most chips in the United States are built are, are are built using Verilog. VHDL came from Department of Defense and Ada. Uh, it's a little better for simulations. It's popular in Europe, and that's what this book uh, includes. So. What is HDL? Well, it's a hardware description language. Uh, it's like a programming language, but it also has time constraints, and it's probably better to call it a modeling language because the instructions don't get executed like a computer program. They, they can be executed simultaneously, or we have some features where we wait for a, a signal, and then we execute the features in that block, and that signal can occur at any time. So, that, so it's very... It's very um, 
it, it, there's a lot going on simultaneously, I guess that, that's the way to think about it. These can describe logic gates to a complete microprocessor or um, whatever, whatever integrated circuit chips out there, these languages can describe them. Now, there are some, there are some uh, purely analog chips that, that, are, uh, that use some other features. And uh, uh, they may, have, may probably still have uh, hardware fe uh, digital features uh, that use a hardware description language, but they also uh, have some other features that make uh, things like capacitors and inductors maybe. Uh, well, I don't know if they can do an inductor, but they can make a little capacitor, um, uh, maybe an operational amplifier and things like that. So there are, there are, there are, um, there are these uh, more, you know, more diverse chips that, uh, that do have a lot of analog features. So you can buy a chip that's just an amplifier. You can buy a chip that's a 555 timer. Uh, there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of analog chips out there, uh, and and I'm not sure just how the analog features are uh, married up with the HDL features. That's uh, not my expertise by any means. But for but for all the digital chips like computers, um, any any digital processing chip, uh, anything. Any, anything that's purely digital is absolutely made with hardware description language. Okay, um, so you can you can take a piece of HDL code and it can be a circuit into itself, or it can be a building block in a, in a larger circuit. Remember, we can always use it for simulation, and then we can use it to program programmable logic like an like a FPGA, or we can uh, use it to actually make uh, a brand new integrated circuit in the foundry. Of course, you generally would have a different integrated development environment depending on whether you're going to program an FPGA or whether you're going to make a brand new chip. There is actually one thing kind of in between those two things. Uh, there are some chips that have been uh, manufactured with all sorts of building blocks, uh, but rather than having a digitally programmable uh, matrix, that you write a bit file into and program the chip like an FPGA. These, these require a metalized mask as a, final, uh, as a final processing step in the foundry. And these metalized masks then uh, are generated as a custom feature to create this circuit to be exactly what you want. And, and sometimes it, the, names are, um, the names are a little bit elusive. We often, we often call those application-specific integrated circuit or an ASIC, uh, but sometimes we use the term ASIC for a brand new chip that uh, doesn't have a new metalized layer to, to take a generic chip and make it more specific. Anyway, so those are the real three end targets. Um, programmable logic, and that means fundamentally FPGAs and CPLDs. Uh, taking a, a, a a chip that just needs one last uh, step, uh, which is a mask to hook everything together um, to make a custom chip. Uh, it's a sort of a partially custom chip. And then to make a brand new chip from scratch. Those are the three targets. Uh, so um, one of the features that we include in all of our uh, projects is what's called a test bench. And the test bench is what's used in the simulation of our code. And, uh, and generally, the programmer not only has to write his code, but he also has to write the test bench to, uh, um, uh, to actually test the code, to simulate it. We normally think of this uh, that you can work in several levels of description in, in your hardware description language. These days, I think for many, many things, uh, most people are working at the highest level they can because they can get more done at that level, and they let the software uh, take care of the lower levels of, uh, of detail. But sometimes you'd have to get involved in the detail to, to get timing closure or to, uh, to make a circuit perform just the way you want it to. We talk about uh, an algorithmic level and data flow levels, which we talk about at the behavioral level. And then you can actually, uh, in these hardware description languages, you can, you can put in a schematic if you want. Now, you know, I... I think that would not be a common event these days because of the um, incredible complexity of many of these chips, but you could theoretically uh, do one for maybe a small part that you wanted to get exactly a certain way. And then once these are all done, then we basically hit the button 
Uh, well, first we're going to simulate it up one side and down the other. But once once we have verified that the design is as tight as we can get and make it, then you hit the button and the synthesizer then either either synthesizes the bit file for the FPGA or all the processing steps to make the chip in the foundry, all the photo masks and all that. So um, anyway, so that's how it developed from documentation to simulation, then to actually s synthesis. It has a rich IEEE history, uh, and uh, both of them are IEEE uh, standards now. Uh, you can, you don't have to throw away older designs uh, because the tools will keep your designs up to date. So you can you can reuse your your code, and that's really a nice feature. The synthesizer basically does the heavy lifting, and generally you have to you have to use a synthesizer that's specific for the target that you're that you have in mind whether it's a FPGA or whether you're going to make a new chip. Uh, here's a simple uh, circuit in VHDL. The, the statements would be C, and you have this funny uh, left uh, less than sign and equal. That's the assignment operator. And then A, keyword and, B, after 5 nanoseconds. The after is uh, optional, but we normally put these in so that when we simulate it, uh, we, can, we can make the simulation match what we believe the 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 actual uh, part will will do now this doesn't this this time delay is not synthesizable uh, the synthesizer doesn't look at this and try and make a gate that has a five nanosecond delay no nope. no can do but what what we do is the sim the simulator looks at that and doesn't let the output change for five nanoseconds after the inputs change so it simulates that propagation delay now hopefully that five nanosecond reflects what the actual hardware will do. And of course, most hardware has a range. Uh, you have typical and maximum and minimums and things like that. So it's, so the simulations can be pretty good, but, but uh, you know, nothing's perfect. So, so here we have A ended with B, so that's this box, and C or with D, that's this box. And they both have a five nanosecond delay. So by the time A changes and E would respond to that change, if, if that were the result, it, it would be 10 nanoseconds. And the simulator would, would in fact, do it exactly like that. Um, so one of the big advantages of our HDLs, it allows us to work at a fairly high abstraction level on our designs. Instead of getting down in the weeds, we can, we can just say, you know, we want to add A plus B. Instead of having to come up with a schematic to design the adder, we can just let the synthesizer do that for us. And the synthesizer will probably use uh, one of the fancy adders. It's not going to do a ripple carry adder. It's actually going to do a fancy adder. Um, probably carry propagate or something like that. Carry look ahead, whatever. Uh, and we might want to wade into those details in there certain situations, but normally we can allow the synthesizer to just handle this for us. Um, we obviously will simulate it before we do the sim synthesizing. And usually we do a pre synthesis simulation and then we do a post synthesis simulation to see if uh, the synthesis actually changes things because uh, we may describe it one way but the synthesizer may implement an entirely different way and that could change how the how the how the timing constraints work we can also break it down into parts and develop each of the parts independently and then put them all together in a in a final uh, system all right so that's all I wanted to say about uh, all I wanted to say about uh, um, the uh, hardware description language. Let's talk about KMAPs a little bit. And I'm going to, so we'll just press ahead. So first off, um, we're, we're going to look at the, uh, how we can use a KMAP essentially to simplify uh, our logic equations. It, it is a, it's a lot nicer way to do it as long as we uh, don't have too many variables. If we have a bunch of variables, uh, then KMAPs break down. They only really work well if you have something like four or three variables. Well, two variables is fine. But when you get to five, it, it's a little harder. Six is doable but difficult. And anything after six is, is problematic. Now, there are some tricks called mapped entered variables and stuff like that. But I don't even teach those because I, I just don't think that's useful. Uh, what we have once you get past KMAPs are computer-based tools. That's what we have. All right. So the other thing is we are going to talk about consensus terms and prime implicants. We'll explain that. But 
But I promise you, we would look at consensus terms, and we'll do that uh, when we in just a little bit. Probably not today. So let's first look at sort of the simplest things. Um, uh, this idea of the minimum form of a switching function. So as some of you uh, in the test realized that there was one problem where you could uh, combine things a couple different ways, and if you combined it the wrong way, you didn't get the you didn't get the answer that was written. Just Sad. I I don't know. I didn't. Uh, yeah, I I didn't realize that at the time. I probably would have put both answers in, but I don't think this test allows you to even give one of two different answers. I don't know. It's kind of a weird thing. But anyway, so so that was a little problem. Uh, you know, usually what I do is there were a couple of problems that had some problems, and I'll probably just either delete those or I'll give people credit or we'll we'll work it out. Um, but anyway. Uh, I know that that did happen on one. And that's the problem with switching algebra. When you use switching algebra, you're never sure if you're going to get the best solution. It's a little bit of a, it's just a little bit of luck. Uh, you can go down a pathway that will get you a simplified solution, and you might think, hey, that's pretty good. It turns out had you gone a different pathway, you might have gotten to a slightly better solution. Well, a K-map cuts through all that. You can look at a K-map, and with a little practice, you can instantly see if what the what the what the optimal solution is, or if there happen to be two or three equivalent solutions, you can see those two, and then you can pick one, or you can look at all three of them, or two of them, or whatever there are. Usually, usually there can be three or four. Or there can be quite a few different optimal solutions in some cases. Usually, an even number. Uh, well, maybe not even always, but usually. Uh, so how do we evaluate the minimum form of a switching function? Well, we basically want it to have the fewest terms, which translates into the fewest number of gates, and then we want it to have the fewest number of literals, which translates into the, the smallest number of inputs to the gates. So even if we can just save one input on a gate, that, that, does, that may, in many cases, uh, cut the cost of making that circuit. Uh, So, so that's so that's how we define the minimum form of a switching function, and we have to remember that that minimum form may not be unique. There may be several minimum forms in any given uh, truth table. All right. So you know this is one of our uh, simplification theorems: x y prime plus x y equals x. We are, and that's what we used in the test to simplify the problem. And again, depending on how you applied it, you could get to two different solutions that were roughly equivalent. Um, you have to use, if you have a bunch of terms, you have to use every term at least one time, but you can use it multiple times if you want. Uh, that's legal, because you can always add uh, an xy prime or an xy term if you have a, already have an xy term, and it doesn't change, it d doesn't change the function at all. So, um, so you can think of it that way if you want, but you can, you can definitely uh, use terms uh, multiple times. Uh, but you do have to use all terms. You can also eliminate some redundant terms by the consensus theorem or other theorems. And, and although we really haven't pushed the consensus theorem on the K-map, you'll see the consensus theorem pops right out and you can see how to avoid. Um, most of the time, we'll, we'll, not, we'll skip the consensus uh, term. We won't include it. But there are times when we want to include the consensus term because it solves another problem called a hazard. And so, so we'll get to that. The result uh, with our switching algebra, though, may not give a minimum form. It depends on the order in which your operations are done, and there might be several minimum solutions. And here's an example. Uh, you can use, you can take this original function here, and it's also the same one here. You can combine them like this and get this, or you can combine them like this and get this. Crazy, huh? So obviously there are times when you, uh, when you would definitely like to, uh, to get the minimum solution and you may not know whether you're there or not and that's one another big advantage of k-maps so the minimum pos is exactly the same as a k as a sop minimum except now we're using this theorem the quantity x plus y times the quantity x plus y prime equals x like the sop it may not be unique and remember with the sop solution we're going to use max terms with the pos with, uh, sorry with the sop we'll use min terms with the pos solution we'll use max terms all right, let's look at our first k-map. We're going to use uh, a two-variable map. Now, here's the truth table. 
Uh, okay. The truth table has two inputs, A and B, and an output F. Now, where do we get this va these values for F? Well, you should remember these come these come from our customer, or sometimes we like to say they come from God, just to help you remember that you don't have to come up with this. This is given to you. Okay. So, if A and B are both zero, we want F to be one. If A is zero and B is one, we want F to be one. But if A is one and B is zero, we want F to be zero. And if they're both one, we want F to be zero. Okay. Fine. So. Here's what it looks like. We want to take the values from, for f, from our truth table and put them into our two-variable k-map. And so uh, each one of these boxes represents uh, a row on our truth table. This box here represents the first row. A, B, a is 0 and B is 0. And you can see we've labeled A at the top, 0 down this column, 1 down this column, B over here, 0 across this row, and 1 across this row. So this box is 0, 0 for A, B. This is 1, 0 for A, B. This is 0, 1, and this box is 1, 1. So now all we do is we just take these values for F and we put them into the right boxes. And let's see. Uh, yeah, here we go. So if you look, yeah, oh, I see. I didn't click on it. This box, this one goes there. This one goes there. And these other two here are zeros. So basically, whenever A is a 1, the output's going to be 0. Whenever A is 0, the output's going to be 1. Uh, this is a little bit of an interesting function because it, it turns out it doesn't depend on B. Uh, so here's our two-variable map. Now what we do, we, we combine boxes. Now we've created this map. If you look back here, if you notice, every single box connected vertically and horizontally, but not diagonally, differs from its adjacent or box below or above it by exactly a single variable. These two boxes, here it's A is 0 and there A is 1, but B is the same. Here A is 0 and A is 1, but B is the same. Here A is 1 and here A is 1, but B goes from 0 to 1. So B changes. So what we can do, it's right back to uh, this theorem. Uh, well, or this theorem, every single box in your truth table is connected. The ones are connected in this way. So if you have two boxes and they only differ by a single variable, you can always combine them and drop one of the variables. And it's the same way with the zeros that we use. Uh, let's see. Oh, went the wrong way. And same thing here. If, you, if you're comparing zeros, you can always combine two adjacent zeros and drop uh, one of the variables. So that's the way to think of it. Whenever you combine two boxes, you get to drop one of the variables. Now, in a two-variable map, that's basically you only have two choices. So in this particular one, we're going to combine these two boxes here. And when we do that, we're going to drop the B variable because here it's 0 and there it's 1. So uh, that that would be uh, a b plus a uh, that would be a prime b prime plus a b uh, sorry that would be a prime b prime plus a prime b so you see the b changes so it drops and we're just left with a prime so the answer to that truth table we just looked at is f equals a prime b prime plus a b you can drop the b's uh, these two terms combined to a prime and you can the other thing you can do is you can loop these two ones, and that gives you uh, that gives you the uh, uh, the resultant a prime. Now, one of the tricks for uh, looking at these k maps is learning how once you've looped two boxes is how to how to read off what that represents. In this case, because in both of these boxes a is zero and the B variable is dropped out, that would be A prime. If we loop these two over here, that would be A. The bottom two rows, that would be B, and the top two, uh, the, I'm sorry, the bottom row would be B, and the top row would be B prime. When we use two variable K maps, there, there's not much to it, but when we go to the next level, a three variable map, we, we, it changes a little bit, it becomes a little more complicated. All right, so let's look at a three variable map, and I think I'll probably quit with this. 
So one of the problems with a three variable map is if we just uh, if we just number them in straight binary order, uh, we're going to have a problem. Now let me maybe I can maybe I can illustrate that. Uh, I'm going to we'll do this. Um, see if this works. Okay. And Uh, I can't see. This is ridiculous. Okay, hang on. I'm going to pause it till I get this working. Okay, continuing. So let me let me switch cameras here, and I will show you. Uh, oh. Uh, oh. Okay, now I can do it. Okay. All right, and we'll focus it, hopefully. All right. All right, now. Um, all right, so. So, let's do, we'll draw a three variable map. So, we can normally draw them, we can draw it one of two different ways. Let's say we're, we're, our variables will be A, B, C. Okay. Now, and I want to make this whole thing. Okay, so we'll make it A, B, C. All right, and we'll go down a little bit. Okay. Now, what I want to do, um, I, I, so I'm going to have one axis where I'm going to have two variables and one where I'm going to have one. Now, in this entire rest of the course, I'm always going to draw them like this. If you want to draw it like this and you put A, B across the top and C down the side, that's fine. You can do that. But I'm not going to do that. I'm always going to do this because I found that confuses students. So we draw a little angle. We'll put, C, uh, we'll put A across the top and we'll put B, C down the side. Now, the side is going to be divided into... The, the length is going to be divided into four, but, but the four rows, but we're only going to have two columns. Because this, this column represents A equals zero, and this column A equals one. This, however, we have two variables for each row. Now, the top row is going to be B is zero and C is zero. The next row will be B is zero, C is one. Now, the next row is a problem. If we did in straight binary order, this would be one zero. But the problem is these two boxes then would violate the rule that you can only vary by one variable because they would vary by two. The zero the A goes from zero to or sorry, the B goes from zero to one and the C goes from one to zero. That's two variable changes. So you could not use our theorem X Y uh, you could not use our theorem X here let me draw it where you can see it. X Y plus x y prime equals x. You wouldn't be able to use that because the, that rule would be violated between these two boxes. So what we do is we we get rid of this and we switch these two rows effectively. We make this row 1 1 and this row 1 0. Now that buys us a couple of things. One, now every box is connected to its neighbor vertically and horizontally by only a difference of one variable. And what's really nice is the bottom is able to wrap around and connect with the top. So we can actually, we can actually, uh, we, we can actually have a, a one up here and a one up there and we can actually loop those together and eliminate one of the variables because they only differ by one variable. In this case it's B is one and C is zero, and up here they're both zero, so the B would drop. So this would be, this would represent uh, A prime C prime. Of course, A prime because it's in the A prime column. All right. So uh, when we get to a four variable map, we'll have we'll have two variables on the top, and we'll have uh, four rows and four columns, and you also have to switch these two columns. 
So you always have to switch the bottom two rows and the, and the rightmost two columns. But we'll get to that in, in, a, in just a little bit. All right, so let me switch back to and I'll shrink myself down. Oops, didn't work, sorry. Okay. All right, so, so we do have to order these rows and columns. So each box differs from its vertical and horizontal neighbors by only a single variable. Now, this is the, probably the number one confusing factor for students. So if you can just kind of get past this, everything will be downhill from there. Uh, all right, and here we go. Here's our truth table. We have F0011010. Okay, so we're gonna, again, we're gonna put just the single variable A at the top with two row, two columns, I mean, and then BC on the side with four rows, and we're gonna switch the bottom two rows. So this is gonna be, it's gonna be zero, one, three, two. That's how the rows are actually ordered. And the columns with, we add two variables for a four variable map, the columns would be ordered the same way. Zero, one, three, two. Okay, so now we can take these. Now, how do you get the, these values from F mapped into this table? Okay, so the thing you have to remember is you switched these rows. But in the truth table, we haven't switched these rows. So every time, so as you, so let's take the first four, zero, zero, one, one. Well, this is easy. So you put zero, zero, and then you put the first one here and that last one there because those rows are switched. So that's zero, zero, one, one. And then you have one, zero, one, zero. So that's one, zero, one, zero. Again, you have to switch that last row. And an easier way to do this is to just number the rows on your truth table and number the rows here. But you have to remember are the boxes here. The boxes are numbered. This box would be box zero, or min term zero, or max term zero for that matter. So you put a, so you call this zero. This is one. This is two. That's three, four, five, six, seven. And once you finally get used to this funny numbering system, everything else is easy. So in this case, look what we have. So we have two ones here touching each other. So we can circle them. But what about this one and this one? We can do the wraparound, right? So let's do the wraparound. And there's our solution. Now, how do we read this off? Well, let's look what variable drops out here. C C is one here and zero there. Both of these A is zero and both of these B is zero. So it looks like C is gonna drop. So we have A prime B. So this, this term would be A prime B. And this term here, let's see. So it looks like in both cases, A is one. Up here, B and C are both zero. Down here, B is a one and C is a zero. So it looks like C is zero. So it looks like the B is gonna drop because it changes. So we're gonna have A, C prime. A, C prime. So the solution to our truth table, and it's the optimal solution, is A prime B plus A, C prime. Now, you might say, well, what about looping these two down here in this row? Yes, that would, give, that would drop A, and that would give you B, C prime. But it turns out you don't need that because you have already covered all of the, all of the ones in this map. You've covered all the ones already, you don't need to add this term. What kind of a term is that? It's a consensus term. And I, I don't think I put that on here, but this would be the consensus term, A, C prime, or sorry, B, C prime. All right, I think I'm gonna quit with that, um, and uh, we'll pick up on this on Wednesday.